but why thank you. Um, so, uh, and then through that, a couple months later, we have another position open. She refers one of her colleagues where she just came from. She gets a referral bonus. Now we have two friends slash colleagues uh, that love working together, working together here. So again, if I were hiring in uh, Denver still and I got a, a resume from Nate, go straight to the top of the pile. If good Nate, to know. If Nate is putting his name on this person or like behind this person, that's good enough for me. And that's how the majority of our um, hires came in. And that's from vendors as well. I mean, we have some trusted vendors, right? I'm past president of BOMA here. I'm a CPM candidate. Uh, BOMA and IRM is very important to me. And if I got a text one day, hey, I saw your position. It's on the down low, but this person might be a good fit. I'm going to have her send you a resume. Again, person goes right to the top. So now you have friends working with friends colleagues uh, they get to work together again uh, and it just makes for a, a great great working environment it makes it easier on us too less recruiting fees uh, on and on and uh, Nick and Simon I see you guys nodding your heads for that as well would you say that that's similar for you guys as well that referrals are a really important part of how you find people very much so exactly what Angela said if we get a referral from someone we know and trust we will make sure that person has an in-person interview and we're very interested to hear from them, as opposed to, no offense, meeting a stranger for an hour, we, you know, it, it makes it a lot more difficult to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, referrals are key for us. Yep, and then I'd second that, all internal um, referrals, get a face-to-face -face interview, and just having somebody that's putting their name behind it, that knows our culture, the way we operate, and thinks it's a good fit, um, we have a much higher success rate with referrals. And I would say, obviously, the counter for that for a lot of people is going to be, well, that's great. But like, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm working in a very small company. I don't have a large network. I don't know anyone at CBRE or anything about anything like that. Do you guys have ideas or suggestions for what's the most strategic way for someone to get in front of you or to get in front of someone from your company if they don't have those connections? I find LinkedIn is very helpful. You know, I had a woman say, uh, I, I see you don't have any uh, openings right now please keep me in mind. Here's my resume. You know, I was at a BOMA event with you before and I've heard great things and I thought, wow. And I've had several people do that. And I think, wow, to, to, to put yourself out there and connect with me on LinkedIn even. Um, and then later I ended up calling her like, Hey, we do have a position. Let's see if you're a right fit. So LinkedIn is a great way. Just, mm. uh, you know, some insight into that person uh, that might be interviewing you and some insight into that company as well. And it shows some yeah. gumption that, mm. as my dad would say. <laughs> I would agree. There, someone who takes the initiative to reach out over LinkedIn or other platforms and makes it not necessarily about a job opening, the fact that they showed that initiative makes them stand out or differentiate themselves from other candidates. Yep. 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 And I, I'd say uh, focus on a cover letter. Focus on differentiating yourself. It's so easy to work through Indeed in these places that you're uh, broadcasting out your skill set across a wide net. But if there's a company that you're really focused and really want to be a part of, um, talk about why you'd be a fit at that company and make it an actual personal cover, an actual personal connection. Mm -hmm. Are there types of communication that you guys get maybe as a hiring manager that you consider sort of inappropriate or that are <laughs> done in such a way that kind of turns you off and, and says, you know, I don't, this is not the right way to approach this? Or do you guys feel like initiative is, is generally just appreciated across the board? I think initiatives, typically, I'll go first because I'm the, the rose among the thorns, as my uh, dad would say as well. <laughs> uh, I think it's it, it's only verges on inappropriate when it's very, very forward. When it's mm. like, hey, Simon, I saw you have an opening. Let's chat today at three or something. It, it would just be a, a bit too, too much. I mean, Simon's obviously very busy. He has to prep. He might not even be the real person behind the hiring. So I think if it, it's, it's a bit too much aggressive. Um, instead of feeling more like camaraderie um, of some sort, or, hey, we have a mutual friend in, in common, something like that. But um, I, I would stay away from being um, terribly presumptuous or, or aggressive in the communication. I would agree with that. I, my personal experience has been when, when people want to connect and build a relationship more than about a specific opening, like I want to talk about openings and opportunities, but wanted to learn more about the company or how they go about it, is a great opener as opposed to I'm interested in this position, I want to talk about that. Got it. 
Um, and it sounds like we're talking a lot about networks here. For you all, what have been the most valuable or useful networks that you've taken part of or that have helped you kind of grow and have helped you get to kind of where you are? Um, if folks don't have ideas about how to do that or, or don't currently have those sort of skills or networks built out. I'd say BOMA and IRAM. I mean, I can't even tell you how many people, and it, like I said, it goes down to, uh, down to our vendors as well. They're certainly not gonna recommend Link if they have had un, unsavory encounters with Link, right? They're certainly not gonna say, oh yeah, you should apply there. Um, but I encourage all my um, team members to only use BOMA and IRAM um, uh, vendors. I'd say probably a third of our uh, team is uh, BOMA or IRAM past presidents, committee chairs, it's, it's such great networking and there's so much camaraderie, there's charity events, there's probably no better way to meet, um, you know, like-minded people in our industry, um, especially because a lot of the BOMA events have uh, wine. So very, very helpful. Yeah, for sure. As a housing provider, we do get a lot of folks from that live at our apartments. Mm -hmm. um, so internal right there, um, they see how we operate and be it on our uh, uh, maintenance staff or our leasing teams. Um, they had a good experience with us and they become employees for us. So, so that's a great internal source as a housing provider. Do you find, uh, do you find that those employees, because they already have the, um, um, permanence of the housing become longer tenured, more involved employees as well? Not necessarily. Honestly, I find that they have a lot of, uh, misconceptions about how our industry actually operates. Um, and they, you know, I wouldn't say their duration is any less than other sources, um, but, but having that experience with us gets them a good head start into, into working with us. Okay. And I would say to folks, don't let your lack of network slow you down. If I get a well-written email and there's no spelling mistakes and it's short and to the point, but it's authentic, it's not like some group email that I'm that I can guess you've sent to 20 different employers, I will take the time to respond, to read it, to go through it and, and connect with you on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. I'm, I'm always curious, especially in this sort of virtual world that we operate in, you know, once you guys are in the process, we're like, okay, we're considering this person or we're potentially going to meet with this person. What are the other sort of pieces of their background that you might look at um, to see if you're sure about that? Does that mean they're, you're always going to check a LinkedIn profile? Or are you going to do a general Google search? Or do you just sort of assume that HR has already done that by the time it gets to you and that stuff's kind of handled? So we don't get to that point until we're pretty far down the road with selecting a candidate. In terms mm -hmm. of prior to an interview, um, literally we just go into it, I don't want to say blind, with their resume or profile that they've provided. And you know, we, we ask some searching questions. But until we get to like its final selection, we, we don't really check references or do anything like that. I think we would take them at face value. But do expect them to be authentic about their strengths, their weaknesses, their skills, et cetera. Nothing is worse than when you go and do the reference check and other things and it doesn't match up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say, and it depends on what, what level we're talking about. I love, um, my start was in multifamily 20 some years ago and I don't think I would ever go back to multifamily. People who have done multifamily, like kudos to you, that is some serious customer service skills right there. So at the administrator level, APM or you know ARAM, whatever you call it, PM. I love to see uh, apartments leasing, um, something like that on a resume because if they can do that, they can certainly handle uh, Amazon as a tenant or FedEx or something. But once you get to about senior property manager, or associate director, there really needs to be some some commercial aspect to it, and you mm -hmm. need to, as you grow in title, you need to have in your resume established that you have managed people and managed teams. Um, and if I don't see that, then even if HR thought you were okay, like it's you know, we've got to find the right fit, but um, love seeing the, the any, any kind of customer service skills on a, on a resume. Gotcha. Nick, did you to Angela's that point, no? it's interesting, the more uh, junior you are in your career, the more we look at education and the mm. more senior or progressed you are in your career, the more experience matters. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's not to say one is more important than the other. We just want to be sure that property management is your career track. Um, you, you, we don't want to hire someone who's just testing it out and six months later they decide it's not for them. And I'm not to say we all know exactly what's in our future, but 
you know how it is. It takes a good three, four, five months before someone is truly productive and doing their job really well. And it's frustrating when, when, when it doesn't work out for, for either side. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, good point. Um, I'm curious, when you guys are doing the interviews, and you talked a lot about um, authenticity, um, are there... Is there, what I'm thinking of is, you know, at a certain point, you may have someone who maybe is not fully qualified for the position. You're hiring them up from somewhere where they're at. Are there personality traits? And, and Simon, you mentioned authenticity quite a bit or something in particular that you look for across all your hires that either you personally believe makes someone good at this at this type of job or maybe matches with the culture of where um, your company is, is sort of situated in terms of personalities. We use uh, behavioral interviewing and really drill down to the way persons interact in different scenarios. Um, you know, if it's just question-based interviewing, people are able to basically make up whatever they want that sounds good. But when you get into behavioral and talking about specific examples, we can really tell levels of empathy, the care that people have, and their willingness to provide great customer service. And across the board, from maintenance technicians to leasing and up to even senior positions, um, if you're unable to provide concrete examples and really relate your past experiences, even if it's from a different industry, um, it makes it pretty obvious that it's not going to be a fit in our, uh, um, our service intensive business. Can you give an example of that, Nick? I'm not sure everyone knows what that um, oh. type of questioning is. So I've got a great one, if you don't mind me jumping in, Nick. Go for it. I always ask people, tell me about a time, you know, we've all got that one tenant that's really difficult to deal with. A one tell tenant? me about a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one at every property, you know uh, yeah, what I mean? And I'm like, tell me about a time you made them happy or you solved a difficult situation with them. And I'm mm. really looking for the whole story to Nick's point. I want to understand how you interacted, how you dealt with the difficult person, tenant, I want to see you display some initiative and in how you solved it. And that you, the way you can tell the story gives us an idea that you're a good communicator. You can communicate with difficult tenants well. So that's, that's one of the questions. And, and Nick, am I right? That's the sort of thing you're asking for? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And along those lines, one of my favorite questions is tell me about something you've done work related that you're proud of, that you want to pat yourself on the back for, even if it wasn't recognized by anybody else. Out of that, you get initiative, you get enthusiasm, and the candidates that really stand out are the ones that are so excited that you asked that question and so happy about changing a workflow process. It really doesn't matter what it is. If you're excited about it and made a positive impact and you're excited to share it. And the people conversely that really don't have an example or say, I got a parking spot for a month because I had the most leases. That's not the enthusiasm we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, interesting to that point. I read recently at Elon Musk's question, he asked, um, you know, engineer type people uh, in, in his interviews, it's not enough to say, oh, I made the tenant happy. I did whatever. He says, how did you do it? How? Um, and of course, that's more important once you get to the technical aspects of engineering and space stuff. But, you know, if I say, you know, um, they say, well, I, I completed a camera and I, um, I saved the, the owner money. Well, how? How did you do it? And, and that demonstrates um, their, their authentic knowledge of how they did it and the self-awareness of, of what they had to, to do to, you know, solve the problem or, you know, create a better workflow, or whatever. But the, the how is very important. And then to Nate's original question, I think it's enthusiasm for me, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I can have the most perfect resume in the world. The best education and i've had some interviews where the person is just sitting there they have no questions for me they have no questions about link they have no questions about the culture i just am thinking okay i've got to talk to this person for nine more minutes like how mm -hmm. do i end this so someone yeah. who's enthusiastic which lends to hey they connected with me on linkedin they reached out to say hi they reached out to say hey i was part of the iron denver call and really enjoyed it that's the enthusiasm you know, that we're looking for. And it can often trump uh, experience and education. Great. Uh, so I'm going to transition. Oh, go ahead, Simon. Sorry, if you don't mind. So authentic, as you pointed out, is, is very important to me and, and, and I think all of us. I like to ask about people's strengths and weaknesses. And what we're looking for is genuinely, we're trying to find how you fit in with the team or a particular client. And each assignment's unique. And there are some that are 
reporting analytical uh, intensive and others that are more like, let's say customer service focused. So what we're looking for is a real answer. And a lot of people give you like a, an easy answer, like on the weakness, oh, it's- I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> yes, yeah, so or something like that. Terrible. And that immediately tells me that that it's not authentic. And, and someone who, who is honest about, these are areas of my skills I need to improve on, tells me that they're probably coachable, which is good. Mm. Um, and, and like I say, as we're building these teams, you, you need to know what strengths and weaknesses are so that you can put them in a team that balances those strengths and weaknesses. The big thing I look for other than that is initiative. I, I want to ask questions and see people display initiative. Um, that tells me you've got someone who is driven, focused, and, and will we'll do a little more than is exactly what, it requir what is required of them. And when you say initiative, you mean an example, for instance, from their work where they went above and beyond or decided to do something on their own? Is that what you're referring to? Sure. Like, I, I have a really, it's a really easy example, but I had an admin a few years ago and we're coding invoices, okay? And she came to me with a question. And I was a little frustrated at first because, of course, I thought I had showed her, here is the budget, you print it off, and you use that to code so we don't have variance comments all the time, right? But she quite correctly pointed out that she'd also looked at the prior three months of invoices that were coded differently to what was in the budget. So the minute she did that, I started paying attention to, she'd done the research, she had listened to me, and displayed initiative by saying, I'm not sure how to do this because there's two different answers here. Got it. Great. Uh, I'm going to transition us just to our next topic, and I don't want to spend too long on uh, uh, fired um, because, A of all, I think um, hopefully most of us are not just about to be fired and need to find a way out of it. Um, but um, I think maybe a relevant question would be um, uh, what you guys see sort of as commonalities when you see someone who you're managing kind of going down the wrong path or heading in that direction um, uh, without, I don't want to drag anybody through the mud or, you know, we don't we bring up specific examples, but just quickly, if you guys could answer anything that comes to mind from that. I think people's personal lives have taken a dramatic change this past year, mm. um, or what are we at, <laughs> year and a half, um, and people's focus. We've had uh, really engaged employees that weren't able to adapt to a more remote environment, and we've seen uh, quality of work product, consistency, and accuracy go down in some scenarios. And the ability to provide the coaching, try to get people on the right track remotely has been challenging. And frankly, it has led to uh, um, some terminations um, just due to the world changing around the person. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the, the people that I've uh, unfortunately have had to, or the company has had to let go, I think one thing strings through it all and it's apathy. It's one thing to care about a job and maybe you're just not catching on to something or you have personal things at home and you can't get to the office on time. I mean, that, that kind of stuff, but you still care, you're still invested. But the people who have just decided, I don't care about this job, I don't care about these people, I'm gonna collect a paycheck as long as I can. I can. It's the apathy where you're no longer even coachable uh, or you're even beyond any kind of motivation of any kind. And it, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised because it really is, it becomes visible to your your colleagues, your your asset managers, your supervisors. That that apathy bleeds into your body language, how you present yourself, your enthusiasm in your emails, your customer service delivery. So, um, it's it's a tough thing to keep you know motivation going. But uh, I feel like once that person's gotten past that point, it's it's pretty much uncoachable, and you're just down that path, and it's just eventual you know a termination. Got it. I agree with Angelo. You know, I try to make sure that both the manager and the employee are very have communicated expectations clearly, like both sides are really clear on it, and that there is an accountability or feedback loop. But to Angela's point, we often get to the stage where there is apathy and lack of motivation and, and nothing's going to fix that. Mm -hmm. How much coaching is enough coaching? Is there, I mean, I, 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 may, I would guess it just is determined by the circumstances of each individual person, right? Depends on the individual. In in my opinion, and what I work with my managers on, is by the time it comes to termination, there hasn't been a stone left unturned. We've gone through the progressive counseling 
we've uh, problem solved with the individual, be it, you know, whatever the issue is, we've presented a plan to get things right track. And when it comes time to terminate, nobody's surprised. Um, and so it depends on the situation, how long that takes, but you have to get to that point that this is not a surprise to either party um, to, to know that you've done enough. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you know, in a perfect world, <laughs> there would be enough trust in, in the relationship between the manager and the employee that there is this good feedback loop. Um, but, but often that trust gets broken along the way, which sometimes, to Angela's point, leads to this lack of motivation and apathy. Um, but so, yes, mate, there's no right answer on that. Yeah. Um, and then my, I think my final question on this would be, you know, if someone has that on their resume, let's suppose they were at a company that wasn't great or, or it just wasn't a good match for them, how should they handle or address that if it comes up in terms of an interview or in terms of looking for a new position? Well, it actually, it happened to me. I, I left a company years, many, many years ago. Um, I won't mention any names, of course, and, and I, I was very clearly said it, it was not a cultural fit. Uh, maybe for them and, and for me, right? They thought they were getting something else. I thought I was getting something else. We, you know, amicably parted ways. Of course, we see each other at industry events, no harm, no foul. Uh, I'm sure maybe they got someone that was more in line with, with you know, their, their company mission. And um, I very obviously, uh, you know, moved on as well. But I think you have to keep it very short and very sweet. Um, I, I can't believe how many interviews um, I've given where the person on the other end that is looking for a job with me goes on and on and on and on about their former employer. And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, I don't need mm. to hear any of this. I might know some of the people mm. and we don't know their side of the story, but there's no, there's no need to give examples and uh, bad mouth anyone. You just keep it very short and sweet. Maybe you left because um, it wasn't the right fit and the life work balance, you know, whatever, but keep it short, sweet, have your canned, canned and polite response and then move on. Yep. Got it. Be upfront about it and focus on the positives that came out of that experience, what you learned, how you grew professionally. Mm -hmm. But don't go on and on about the employer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably just not a good idea to trash talk, talk people generally. Yep. Just yeah, a bad, right. just a bad habit. Pretty much in all of human life, I think we can we can say that. Real estate, the property management is a very very small industry, as we yep. all know, and uh, it's you know it, it's it's going to follow you. For sure. All right, uh, let's move on to promoted here, which I think is is probably maybe even the most relevant or exciting for the most folks. Um, uh, I know Nick, you and uh, you and Simon have both been in in your current company for for quite a while. Um, I was wondering if you guys either had an example of someone you think is really notable that's risen up with you guys, or even your own story, if if you think there's some good lessons from there about. Um, and I would say it's not just about how to get promoted. I think it might also be about how to find the right fit and, and how to know you're in the right place where you want to follow that path. Do you guys have any um, examples or anything you want to bring up from that? Yeah, I've got a fun one with, uh, he's one of my area managers now, but actually uh, through a family friend started with us when he was in high school. So during breaks, he'd come in and do landscaping work with our maintenance team. Uh, we gave him a uh, refiling project, some audit projects, and different things throughout his high school. Then when he uh, um, went to college, we had him for uh, summers. I had him with my accounting team one summer, my leasing team one summer. Um, and at that point, he uh, decided to uh, come work with us full time um, and move through leasing, has a good experience with our maintenance team. Um, and is at this point our uh, youngest area manager with a uh, portfolio of about 10 buildings and just killing it in his uh, young 20s. And through having him in our different areas and just being there as uh, employment support and really uh, professional learning, we're the only job he's ever had, but he's got exposure to a lot of different things within us. And I'm excited to watch his career progress in the next several years. Cool. So at, at CBRE, we have a culture from promoting what, from within. We have uh, 11 different managers who started in admin positions and have worked their way, way up over time. And it, it's A, by design, and B, because it works. No offense, no matter how good we think we are at interviewing, sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. And taking someone we've worked with and we have you know, some history with, we know what their strengths and weaknesses are, it's a whole lot easier to work with them and you know those that have shown initiative and, and drive you know to 
um, move, move on up in their careers, we literally sit down with them, we map out a career with them, and we encourage them to have a conversation with their supervisor about what skills do they need to improve on or more experience do they need to be considered for the next level. And then we work collectively on how do we get that experience for them. Sometimes it's challenging, you know, if you're a two person team, it's not always easy to get experience doing operating expense reconciliations or budgets. But, for, you know, at a larger company, we have the ability to shift people around or have them assist on a different team. And no, nothing impresses me more than someone who actually goes ahead and has that conversation without our prompting. If they've gone to their manager and supervisor and said, what do I need to do to be considered? How do I get that experience? Someone that's focused on their career like that certainly stands out amongst everyone else. Got it. And I think you guys have answered my, my next question already, which is whether ambition in that regard is an asset or a liability. Um, do you have uh, experiences with folks who, for instance, are, are too are unhappy with where they are and too trying to get to the next thing to do what they're doing currently right? I mean, I think it sounds like a part of this would really be like, you've got to excel at your current job um, before anybody's going to consider you for, for what's next. I'd agree for sure. I think ambition only gets in the way when um, it feels like entitlement. You know, if someone were to walk into your office and say, I've been here one year, I need to be an assistant manager now. It'd be like, well, or when you interview people and they're like, how soon can I get promoted? How, how long will I be an admin? It's just, you know, all those things are case by case, of course. And mm -hmm. um, it, it feels very entitled. Everyone has a different path and a different course. Um, but I think the right amount of ambition where it comes from an intrinsic desire to do well, to excel, to, uh, you know, impress your boss, to, to just be a good manager. I think it has to come from this, this intrinsic thing where, where you want to be better and you want to learn. It can't come, well, I've been here for one and a half years. Now I should be a senior manager. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Skill-based ambition versus uh, knowledge-based ambition. <laughs> yeah. Nate, I'm going to answer your question slightly differently. I, I try to take a more individual approach, but yes, I mean, you know, too much ambition can be harmful. It, we try to treat everyone as an individual and depending on where you are in your life and the other things you're dealing with may dictate how much time and energy you're willing to put into your career. And there are some people who are not super career focused. It doesn't mean they're not doing their job, their role very, very well. And there are others that are super focused on advancing their careers and you know, we, we try to key into where they're at. Can they put in the time and energy available to learn more and grow their experience? And some people are not at that point um, for, for all the reasons that are fine. Um, and, and we try to work with all of them and, and not sort of have one box where everyone needs to advance their careers. But to your original point, I agree, too much ambition can actually be a bad thing. Got it. Yeah. And actually points to another question for me, because I think we also have managers here, obviously folks who manage maintenance techs or assistant junior managers or things like that. You know, how do you all keep people who maybe their career and advancement ambition is not very large, which which I think we all know is those those people are great. Someone solid who knows how to do their job and is going to stay with it. But my question is, how do you keep those people engaged and how do you make sure that they're continuing to feel sort of fulfilled or taken care of if if getting to the next thing isn't going to motivate them? Keeping them engaged in feedback when, you know, it can be a uh, um, line level employee who's been with the company for several years, that's awesome. If everybody gets promoted, you wind up with problems. Um, but engaging all levels of your company, you know, if it's a upper level thing, if it's a, uh, if it's a um, employee party, make them part of the committee, pull them out of their comfort zone slightly, but engaging with all different levels and keep the job fresh to them. Um, move them from property to property for career property managers, staying at the same property for too long gets stagnant and mm. things are gonna suffer. Move to a new property every couple of years. Um, can be the same job responsibility, but it's fresh and new. I think also uh, finding out what they like to do. You know, if you've got that one property manager, they like, they got their stuff. They don't wanna be a senior manager. They never envision themselves in a director's shoe. But what if they like to do little projects once in a while? Like, you know, we all have projects that come out, energy benchmarking or some other kind of, we gotta, we gotta audit the leases for management fee language. I don't know, whatever. Or maybe Bonding like, is the funnest. That's oh, definitely my project. Fun. That's what I would do. That's, that's what I use for punishment, not for <laughs> reward. <laughs> 
people out there. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Finding what motivates them and what they enjoy doing and throwing them those projects and getting them involved with different people they may not normally work with. And then they feel a little rewarded, even if it's something they just like to do. Like, I love CAM. Maybe you guys, some of you have been to my, my CAM classes for Iron. Love it. Um, I got to help with Link's entire rollout of, of CAM across the country. We had, I think, 5,000 CAM recs to do um, this past year. So coordinating the training and doing that kind of stuff, that's that's fun to me. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. I, you know, I, I get a little gift in the mail. They were so thankful. And, um, you know, my, my, I feel like my, um, my opinions are heard. I feel valued. I feel recognized for my efforts. And it's kind of, it's a win-win for everybody. Got it. Simon, so, mean, anything you want to add or no? No, Angela covered it. You get great. to know your people. What's the two or three most important things to them and do what you can to build that into their work week. Mm -hmm. and, and that makes me think or, or be curious about kind of the process that you all have for your reviews with your employees. Um, and we, we don't have to go into great depth on that, but I'm kind of curious going in and coming out of that, what, what to you feels like a success? You know, is it a matter of you want something addressed and you see it getting addressed or you get real feedback from the employee and you get to understand how they're feeling? I mean, when you guys do those, what, what, what feels like a success to you when you leave an evaluation like that? goals section you know we have our canned things for each position that we talk about that are specific to their role but with every employee we have the blank section of setting three goals and that's full engagement of what is important to the employee let's set some benchmarking to uh, start to achieve that and that's where we really find out that you know we have a maintenance technician that wants to move into leasing how can we help get them? to that step. What do they need to do to get there? So for me, the uh, review process is very bland up until we get to the goal setting. <laughs> I think a success to me feels like when what the, the person feels like they need to work on matches up with what I feel like they need to work on. There's nothing worse than when I say, okay, let's develop these three areas. And they're like, what? That's that's not what I need to work on. I have these other yeah. couple of things and I'm like, ooh, we are not on the same page here. Um, and it shows a lack of self-awareness, I think, when um, people aren't um, aware of you know, the, the weaknesses, opportunities, or whatever you want to call it. But um, having no surprises, as Nick mentioned earlier, when there's no surprises in that person's review, there shouldn't be any surprises. It should be a time to reconnect, provide some corrective feedback, um, set some goals. Um, and two, I love when the goals align, right? These are my three goals for you. And maybe hopefully two out of three match up with what you envisioned for yourself. That means I'm in tune with what you're trying to do. And you're also on the right path, um, I hope, <laughs> because you know it, it matches up. Yeah, agree completely. There should be no surprises. I really like it when an employee comes prepared and we have a great discussion about, to next point, goals, development, next steps. Um, and it's not just one-sided of us sort of telling them, well, this is how you did, or this is where you need to put more time and energy. Mm -hmm. Got it. Great. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, obviously IRM is an education-based organization. You all are involved in, I think, fans of it, I hope at least. <laughs> I hope you're not here uh, out of resentment. Um, so I'm kind of curious uh, what role that plays in people's advancement. You know, I mean, do you guys feel like the within each of your companies, obviously, if people have enough experience, they know the job, they're ready for that? Or do you guys feel like, I think, I think here's my question. When, for instance, is it time for someone to go get more education? Is that based on their ambition or, or are there roles where you're going to say, hey, you know, no matter what, I, I can't put someone into this until I know that they, ha they have a knowledge of real estate accounting or budgeting or things like that? It's the employee's ambition. I'll support it. I'll put someone through whatever program to help them advance their career. But it's rare that unless it's a, unless it's a government agency that's requiring it, um, it's rare that I'm requiring somebody to get a certification. I may suggest it can help them, but they need to provide the ambition to do it. Same. And, and that's maybe a bridge for them if, if within the company they work at, there's nowhere for them to go or, or that extra experience isn't, isn't available, then it's time to look at that in terms of finding a new position to sort of bridge that gap. And do you guys feel like that's reasonable too? Like maybe you'll see someone whose experience doesn't match up um, with the position that you're hiring for, but they have an education that sort of bridges that, that that sort of helps. I think it's always great to see an RPA or CPM on someone's resume. It, it, I think it's great. They showed the gumption to do it. 
again, I'm channeling my, my dad apparently, but um, it showed that they were dedicated to it, that they got it done. It also shows some level of involvement in the industry, which is, is always helpful too. Um, it's not a make or break. It's not like it's, okay, senior managers should have a CPM or should have an RPA. I think it's more of a, of a bonus. And I may grab that resume and put it on top of one, you know, that doesn't have something like that. Um, but otherwise, it's definitely not a, uh, a, a you know, it's, it's not going to disqualify you in my eyes. Yeah. Um, and then one other thing I want to touch back on, Angela, that you mentioned um, uh, for everyone, but you had mentioned that the ability to work with teams and sort of manage people um, is an important skill at certain levels. And I think, I think we, we can all agree, or I would suggest that as you get higher, the number of people you're going to have to successfully work with um, and have good people skills um, increases. Um, so my question is, how do people get those skills? And are there any things that you guys see when you're promoting or when you're hiring people? that tell you, oh, wow, this person gets how to work with people. Maybe they don't know budgeting as well as I'd like, but I'm confident I can put them here and they're going to be able to manage people. Yeah, you know, so, some people, Nate, oh, go ahead. sorry, go ahead, Angela. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, some people are just naturally better managers of people than others, either because they're intuitive, they're just normally communicative. I feel like most of it can be taught. In fact, we, um, Link had rolled out a series of leadership um, courses for I think PM and above and I had my own like effectively managing people um, webinar I did I did it recently for Iron Phoenix but I think by the time you get to be a senior property manager that management of teams and people and being a, a self-starter and initiative like Simon mentioned because Simon could uh, have teams in Albuquerque he's got to rely on the, the senior people there his senior managers and, and directors associate directors to to get stuff done out there he's not there all the time same with me in Denver Vegas Phoenix uh, so by, by the time you're a senior property manager, you should have a solid understanding of how to motivate someone um, without keeping tabs on them, not be a micromanager, learn how to engage with people to find what they're motivated by. And um, it, it is sometimes skill building and, and we hope that with some of the leadership courses and training, the HR courses, we help get you there. Um, and it usually doesn't take long uh, to find out that, that you're not there, right? Because there's some discord on the team or someone's called HR something like that, but um, it, it mm. certainly can be taught. It just takes time and it, you're, you can't really get there until you go through the, um, the actual instance uh, of it, right? The coaching your assistant manager, coaching your admin because they're always late. Those things come with time and situational um, behaviors that you have to hone. Uh, so so, so Nate, that's a great question because we, we found a lot of property managers are successful because they're control freaks. We control every single aspect on our property and make sure it's dialed in and running well. But mm. this often makes you not a very good people manager. Mm. And so it's a new skill set that people need to be open to learning. And to Angela's point, there are many courses you should be doing um, if that's a direction you would like to see your career go in. And if you don't have experience and you're applying for a job where you're going to run a larger team, you've maybe only you know, managed one or two people before, like be ready to talk about leadership books that you've read or a podcast that you follow, but be ready to discuss what you learned and how you think it applies and maybe a mistake you've made along the way so that you can demonstrate that you're at least thinking of how to be a better coach versus a property manager, which isn't always the greatest approach to managing people. Got it. Um, I'm going to um, uh, open it up to questions in just a minute or two, uh, but I'll ask one more question so that um, everyone who's listening can start rotating their brain a little bit to hopefully throw out some other things that maybe they want to hear from you all. Uh, but I'm actually curious for you all, as you all have gotten to more senior positions, what was something that you had to learn in order to uh, be able to do the job that you do now that didn't come naturally to you? So for me, it was leadership. I, I literally decided I needed to become a student of leadership. And I read a lot of books and started doing courses. And the more I did it, the more I'm like, this really is my thing. Um, but I was not a, a born leader or anything if you like that. Um, and, and I saw it as, you know, my success was really their success. So, you know, I learned that the, the more I worked with people and helped them succeed, the more successful I would be. Got it. Yep. I think for me, I am uh, hard headed and thinking of an approach to get to uh, from point A to point B understanding that there's different ways to get from point A to point B and allowing us to veer to A.2 and eventually get there. 
um, really helps build the team rather than being uh, um, just too commanding about here's how we're going to do it. You got to have the involvement. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's, um, you know, my management seminar, it's called, um, you know, uh, teach them to fish and then let them fish. I'm a get it done, not quite type A, mostly type A. Okay, I'm type A, but I, I, I need to let- It doesn't come across, we, you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I were to do like one of my great team members is on the call right now, Jan, let's say Jan needed help with something. My first instinct is to do it for no other reason than I know she's busy and she has other things to do and I could help her by doing it but it's not helping her learn how to do it. So I've had to learn how to take a step back and say, all right, this is where you find this. This is how you do it. Circle back with me at the end to see if you did it right or if you need more help. But I need to, instead of jumping on everything and trying to take care of things for my people and and all that, because I just love my team so much, I just have to sit back and be like, all right, here's where you find it. Here's the standard operating procedure for this. I'll let you read through that, get through as much as you can and then come back to me. And so, you know, taking it back a notch, letting them do the work and learn by trial and error is uh, something I, I still work on actually. Right, cool, thank you guys, I appreciate that. Um, so if there are any questions, obviously people just throw them in the chat there. I always have a million questions, so I'll, I'll just continue to talk. I think the thing that we've sort of actually not mentioned, which, which feels great to me guys, is COVID. And, and my question would, would sort of be, do you all see in terms of your management, your people and your talent, do you see everything kind of going back to normal or have there been, changes that this this period and this event have caused that you know are, are going to be permanent in the way that you guys are, are dealing with uh, your staffing and and you know that could be work from home or it could be hiring or it could be promoting I'm just curious anything that comes up for you from that question I think the biggest change for me was all of my pants are too tight now I don't know if anyone else has the same issue but all the pants are too tight yeah. um, other than that you know we're going to be kind of slow getting back into the office so there's still going to be a lot of a zoom for us uh, but what I hope is there's just more of that face-to-face kind of stuff like, hey, you want to go grab a coffee or, hey, we have a problem. Let's go down the hall and talk to so-and-so. So I'm hoping that that more of that in-person camaraderie comes back instead of us getting so used to Zoom. I mean, that's great. We all got so used to it. It's, we were all productive, but it never, never you know, can replace the sitting across from your asset manager and just developing relationships and trust and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the way people work, we found that uh, some people are highly effective out of the work environment. Other people really need that uh, routine. Um, and we're going we're gonna to maintain flexibility. Flexibility is the new normal. And if, uh, you know, some employees are coming into the office from 11 to 3 and that's it on a day, but it works for them, perfect. Um, we need to bridge the gap of being able to have the quick conversations. With COVID, one of my biggest challenges were taking the temperature of everybody, understanding my employees that were feeling pressured and ones that had additional time. Without the office setting and without that scheduled interaction, just the day-to-day stuff, you're not scheduling a Zoom to just check in how, with how things are going for somebody. So we've got to get that blend back and we're getting there. It's, uh, it's coming back kind of organically. And at some point in the next several months, we'll have to do some requirements, but we will be more flexible than we were pre-COVID. Mm. Our challenge is with our on-site folks. So we have two distinctly different teams. The portfolio teams mainly do industrial and retail, so they do not sit on-site. And even pre-COVID, we had some sort of a hybrid system. Obviously, it's now a lot more hybrid. But what we're trying to figure out on an owner-by-owner, case-by-case basis is, what do we do with the on-site folks? If many of you know, our owners are literally paying us to sit in their buildings every single day. We're not sure how we're going to deal with that and what owners are going to expect of us and what our tenants are going to expect of us towards the end of summer in terms of being there every single day. Mm. And, you know, clearly the engineers had to be there all through COVID and did a phenomenal job and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude, but we're trying to figure out with our owners, what does that look like six months from now for the property management folks? Mm. Interesting. Um, A great question from Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, How often are you adjusting compensation due to the market and lack of candidates? And that also points to the question, you know, we're hearing labor shortages obviously a lot of lower paid jobs, is that also present for you guys or, 
or and not so much with the level of, um, I mean, obviously I suppose if you're hiring maintenance techs, I know the labor market is incredibly tight here in Denver at least. I think for the right candidate, we're always, well, Link is always willing to move the compensation and just, you know, see how it plays out. I mean, we have a range obviously, but if we came across someone really great and said, hey, we need to bump this up a little bit, it happens. In my markets, I have no lack of candidates. I had two administrator positions open. I had 50 applicants. I had three assistant manager positions in SoCal. I had uh, like 70 applicants. So none of wow. that. My okay. teacher park who has Seattle and uh, Bay Area has been um, six months now looking for an admin. And these admins mm. come in, they're like, well, we need 100K because they can go get that at a tech firm. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, there comes a point you just don't adjust the comp anymore. There's, there's no world where we can pay an administrator $100,000 when, I mean, it's just not going to happen. So there comes a point you just can't adjust anymore. And you have to either cast a wider net or maybe they become remote. Maybe you hire them in SoCal. They work remote in for, you know, Seattle. Uh, there's different things that need to be thought of before you just start throwing money um, and, and, and just completely dismissing any salary range you, you know, you had. If that's the case, I'll just go be an admin in Seattle. My life would be a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> a lot less stressful, yeah. A lot less stressful. Well, that's what you think. Be, yeah. Well, that, that admin's going to get a heavy workload, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I do have a question. Yeah. You know, in the 11 years that I've been with Iram, I have never talked to a property manager who says they're having a slow day. Um, they are, it, the job as I interpret it is drinking from a fire hose constantly, um, going from one urgent situation to another. And what I was hearing you guys say is, you know, you've got to be patient, you've got to train, you've got to, um, you've got to really manage in a way that, that let's be honest, it takes time. How do you manage the time for the kind of training and oversight you guys are talking about in that fire hose environment? Job shadowing is training. <laughs> you can be solving a problem while teaching. Mm -hmm. Jody, I think we all make the mistake of, you know, we've got a whole list of urgent things we've got to do on, on any given day. And we need to prioritize what's really important to us and to our careers and to our future and maybe move training up a few more notches on our priority list so that it's not the last thing we think about on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock um, because otherwise those things never happen. And, and agreed, it, it is a struggle and it is a challenge because we all have way too much to do. Yeah, and as a property manager, eventually you just let your cortisol levels settle right here by your eyeballs. So you just, you don't worry about it. I used to not sleep when I started this work, but now, you know, I just know, well, I think it's, you know, which pot is about to boil over. You know, they all seem like they're boiling over all the time and you know which one you got to pull off the stove at the last possible minute. So um, I'm better at juggling. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah. And, I think and just, oh, go ahead. I was going to say just shutting off, just being like, that's it. I did enough today. You know? Well, and remembering that everything's important, not everything is urgent. That yeah. tenant who's screaming at you that his lights out, it might yeah. be important to him. It is not urgent. Mm -hmm. and, and learning how to prioritize your time, but you just have to, you really have to make a conscious effort to say, all right, these two hours, we are going to learn this, phones off, email away, okay. catch up, drink some from the fire hose, and you, you just keep going. Yeah. So uh, we're going to just about bring it to a close there. Um, I want to, again, uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, all that was great. Um, and uh, I'm really excited. We're going to have two more conversations like this about different topics. Um, uh, and these are happening once a month throughout the summer. They're all lunchtime events. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, we'd love to have you come back and, and join us for our, our next one with these same panelists, uh, although Nick might be switched out, um, uh, not because he's replaceable but just because it may not be his area of expertise, but it will be uh, potentially uh, Zvi or someone else from Boutique. Um, but next time we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, the, the sort of relationship between tenants and owners um, and talking about how as managers and owners, people make decisions that affect those relationships with tenants. So if you're a property manager and you feel like you're constantly being, being told to prioritize something that doesn't seem important to you, or you're not understanding how the actual asset owner is making decisions about how to deploy um, capital or make decisions about improvements, uh, that would be a great one for you to join us for. We, we hope you will. Um, and then Jody has just a few things and then we are all done and it looks like we're right on time. So that's good for everybody. We are. I just want to thank Nate. Uh, you are, Nate is so curious and uh, I hope that you found this conversation very 
organic and engaging because it was extremely organic and engaging. These uh, Nate was, you know, managing this like a champ, and I really appreciate you. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, our sponsors today. Our sponsors are Keeson Landscape, LMI Landscape, Trinity Commercial Roofing, and Integrity Fire Safety Services. And I have Ira here, and I just wanna make sure you all see Ira and, and know what he looks like. So Ira, say just a, a few words so people can put a face with the name. Hello everyone, I'm Ira Coleman. I'm uh, the Director of Sales and Marketing at Integrity Fire Safety Services. What a perfect conversation that we had today. Um, I just did all my quarterly check-ins, not reviews, but check-ins uh, with uh, the individuals I have an opportunity and a blessing to lead. And uh, something that really resonated with me is understanding each individual as a person um, and understand where they're coming from. And one of the main questions I asked during this quarterly check-in was, do you see yourself as a leader? And Simon said that he had to make the decision to become a leader and he took the direction to educate himself and make that conscious choice every single day to become a, a leader. And, and that's something I'm doing with my green team um, is to identify, do they believe themselves as a leader? If so, what can they do to show up as a leader? And if they don't, remind them that they have leadership opportunities and qualities within them on a regular basis. So uh, one, Nate, thank you very much for, um, for facilitating and Angela, Nick and Simon, thank you very much for providing your insight and, and Iram, uh, thank you for being a great partner for Integrity Fire and, and giving me an opportunity in the platform to speak to everyone. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone. Everyone. Please join us yeah. next time and invite some yeah. colleagues if you, if you like, we'd love to have more folks show up and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks all. Thank you everybody. everybody. Take yeah. care.